Good afternoon. So welcome to 7th of the Sing Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Catherine and I'll be your MC for today. So thank you for taking the time to join us online. Today's event is organized by the Yobun Kim Mai Sai Center with support from Mr. Tao Heng Tan and donors who supported Mai Sai Center's mission to improve mental health and resilience across all ages. The center takes an upstream and evidence-based approach to optimizing cognitive performance, building emotional resilience, and promoting mental well-being through mind, uh, translational research and community-based interventions. Fully dependent on grants and donations, the center is deeply grateful for all the generous support. So kindly note that this event will be recorded for archival and marketing purposes. NUS and our partners may use some of the images and videos in online and print publications. Do you need any assistance, uh, please use the chat function to uh, get my colleague to assist you. Without further ado, I would like to invite the Tan Gyok Kim, mm -hmm. Professor in Psychiatry and Neuroscience at the National University of Psychiatry uh, of Singapore and Vice Chairman of Yobun Kim Mind Science Centre, Professor Kwa Yi Hyok, to give the opening address. Prof Kwa, please. Thank you, uh, Catherine. Um, in the flyer, you will notice that uh, it's supposed to be Professor John Wong, and, and, and uh, Professor John Wong is catching a plane to Australia, I'm told, and, and can't make it today. So I'm standing in as a chairperson of this webinar. And I want to welcome all of you to the 7 Tao Tian Sing Distinguished Lecture Series. Um, and some of you are listening from Australia and from Malaysia. Uh, just to let you know, it's a, it's a beautiful afternoon here in Singapore. Um, I want to thank uh, Mr. Tao Heng Tan for the generous donation uh, in the name of his father, uh, who was an early pioneer here in Singapore and who imbued in his children um, the values of compassion, care, generosity. And the previous uh, Tao Tian Singh distinguished lecturers in, in included, the, the first one was Professor Norman Sartorius, who was the Mental Health Director at World Health Organization in Geneva. And then it was followed by Professor Hong Hai, and later on, um, Professor um, Jeremy Montero, also Professor Ku, uh, uh, Fu uh, Kyung Tak from uh, SGH. And we also had um, Dr. Tamuji and also Mr. Uh, um, the, other, the lecturer was uh, Wang Gangu as a, a lecturer. So today we are very glad to have uh, Professor uh, Rati Mahendran to deliver the seventh Tao Tien Singh Distinguished Lecture. Yeah. Some of you may know uh, Professor Rati well, and she was at one time the Chairman Medical Board, which is equivalent to Medical Director of IMH. And she belonged to the first generation of psychiatrists trained locally and one of our, our best uh, clinician and researcher here in Singapore. Um, she has conducted a, a very major study and I, I thought it was the first study in Asia, but someone told me that it's probably the first in the world in which we're able to gather all the specialists in the study of aging. It's not just the psychiatrists, the psychologists, but also the, the uh, people in, in, in dentistry, uh, um, also in cardiology, nutrition, uh, sociology, anthropology, even economics. So the, the data we have is massive. And uh, Professor Mahindra will focus on an important topic uh, um, are women more at risk of dementia? And she's the first woman to be invited to deliver this special lecture. So, Professor Mahendra, please. Okay, thank you, Prof. Kwa. Yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to uh, provide an overview of some of the factors that put women at risk of mental illness first. And then I will review the prevalence of some mental conditions uh, from the research. And finally, I'll focus on a group of older women and their risk of uh, mental illnesses. And this is data from the uh, community study that Prof Kwa mentioned just now. So next slide, please. Yeah. So gender differences uh, in terms of roles, activities, and behaviors expected of women and men in social and economic areas do differ and they have they can impact um, how the individual uh, lives their lives, leads their lives, and and of course puts them at risk also of developing uh, mental disorders. Um, risk situations faced by women include uh, unique biological situations such as pregnancy, birth, and postnatal period, uh, infertility, 
menopausal transition with hormonal changes, and another big area, uh, which is partner violence, which more often than not results in women being the victims. Then we have various social and cultural institutions uh, and the practice of religion, and all these also determine how um, children, right, the daughters and sons are brought up, and in a way, does uh, affect, you know, subsequent coping behaviors, uh, adapting to life and so on, and the risk of mental illnesses. And finally, of course, life expectancy. Uh, we do know that life expectancy is increased in women, and recent findings in Singapore show that actually women uh, have a ex life expectancy of 85 years, much more than males uh, who only have a, a life expectancy of 81 years. And so women more likely to outlive their partners. And the added issue, of course, is that uh, they may end up alone uh, in their old age. Issues of financial uh, problems, uh, difficult, difficult life events that they have to face um, when they are alone. And these kind of things, again, increase the risk of mental illnesses. So next slide, please. Um, mental health problems in women and men really depend on two things. Firstly, the types of conditions and the life stages when these problems are diagnosed. For example, we find that young women are three times more likely to experience eating disorders, for example, more at risk of self-harm and also depression. Whereas in comparison, young boys, right, are more likely to have conditions such as an attention deficit disorder or attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder or to turn to substance abuse. Next slide. Depression in women. Women are twice as likely as men to be affected by depression. Now, uh, unfortunately for those uh, who are at risk of uh, suicide attempts, we find that in women, it is much higher than in uh, males, all right? Uh, however, when it comes to completing the act, right, and uh, the suicide attempt actually ends in lethality, we find that it's much higher in males, really, because uh, males tend to use more lethal methods. And so completion of uh, suicide is higher in males as compared to females. Now, 10 to 15% of women will experience postnatal depression after giving birth. And amongst women who have major depressive disorders, what we do find is that they are more likely to have comorbid or a co-occurrence of another medical condition. And very often it is an anxiety disorder. It could be an eating disorder like bulimia, or it could be another anxiety disorder like a somatization disorder. Now, reasons are really unknown, right? We, we, we sort of uh, think from what research we have that there are several potential causes. It could be biological causes, such as hormonal changes, hormonal differences, and it could be other factors, social isolation, poverty. These could contribute to this kind of picture that we see in women. Now, next slide, we look at anxiety. Again, just as in depression, women in anxiety, women are twice as likely to experience anxiety disorders. And again, there are very frequent co-occurring other mental conditions, such as social fears and depression. So again, you see the similar picture is not just having one condition, but co-occurrence is quite frequent in women. Women are about 1.6 times more likely to experience obsessive compulsive disorders as compared to men. And about 21% of women have specific phobias. And these are things like fears of flying, fear of blood, fears of animals, uh, and so on, right? Again, specific phobias are very much twice as much in women as compared to men. In men, the kind of comorbidity that you get is really things like substance use disorders, not the depression and those kind of disorders that we see in women. Next slide. Another condition, right, a post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, this is diagnosed when symptoms arise following exposure to either an actual event or there was an event in which that individual uh, was at risk of facing death. 
there was serious injury and uh, the other area is sexual violence. So when symptoms develop as a result of these occurrences, a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder is made. And throughout the world, more women are affected by post-traumatic stress disorder. And this is mainly because of the high levels of sexual violence that they face. So lifetime prevalence of PTSD is about 10 to 12 percent compared to only 6 to 8 percent in men. The next big group that we come to is dementias. And here again, women are at higher risk than men. Now, one of the possible causes is, of course, age, because we know as age increases, so does the risk of dementia. And we do know, uh, not only in Singapore, like I mentioned earlier, life expectancies for women are much longer than for men. So that's one possible reason why uh, the risk is higher for them and more of women seem to uh, suffer from dementia. The, the other, other possible reasons are also that women tend to have more medical comorbidity than men. And again, that increases the risk of developing things like vascular dementias, for example. Uh, women also tend to live alone, uh, older women. And, and of course, this is an additional risk factor for late life neurocognitive disorders, the loneliness that is associated with living alone. All right, so can we go on to the next uh, slide, please? Now, um, last year, SAWA, the Singapore Alliance for Women in Aging, actually interviewed uh, several older women uh, to look at their experiences in life. And one of the things that they found was many of the women tended to prioritize their families. So, and they also took on a great deal of caregiving responsibilities. So basically what happened was they would give up their jobs to look after, to help their children, for example, uh, look after uh, their own grandchildren, right? So they would, they would leave a job to look after grandchildren. They would also take responsibility for looking after their own parents if they were still around and needed help. Uh, so as a result, a lot of them, of course, would be out of work and that would uh, uh, was affecting their financial security, their income and so on. And where women still continued to work, right, a lot of them faced workplace ageism and stereotypes. But then they were very often stereotyped. They were seen as being slow, um, less productive and less adaptable. So on the whole, women were, were, are actually not were, but are facing a lot of issues on the ground. And these again translate to uh, possibly mental health conditions. The next slide, please. And so now I come to uh, a study that we did uh, sometime. We started in 2018 and we continued the study till uh, October of 2021. And this is the study uh, which attempted to uh, gather as much information as we could amongst older adults who lived in the community. We were aiming for about 1,000 adults, and we wanted to build a biopsychosocial model to understand how they were aging in place, right? So it was very extensive, and as Prof mentioned, uh, there were several investigators who came in to look at different aspects of the individual. For example, their health, their physical wellness, uh, cardiovascular status, and so on. So let's go to the next slide. This study was actually done at a study site uh, somewhere in the uh, southwest part of Singapore at uh, what is known as the Henna Active Aging Center. All right? And then from that center, we sort of uh, went out over a 10 kilometer radius to recruit individuals. All right? And uh, can we go on to the next slide, please? So, in the end, we recruited a total of 996 individuals. And I'll just provide you an overview of the whole cohort first before we focus on the women who participated in this study. So the average age of the cohort, right, individuals who participated was 68 years. So actually, they are the young old, not the older old. In fact, we only had one individual who was in his 90s. Um, the majority were in their 60s and early 70s. Subjects were predominantly 
of Chinese ethnicity. So about 95.2% were Chinese. And significantly, they were fairly highly educated. Up to a third had university education. And if you compare this to the national population, right, uh, where the university education is only in about 10%, 10.5% of the population. So you can see, again, high levels of education in this cohort. And years of schooling, on average, they had about 13 years. So at least they would have completed their A-levels or they would have a diploma. So this was the picture of the cohort uh, that was uh, examined uh, in this study. Can we go to the next slide, please? All right. So now focusing on the women who were in this particular study, all right, and they made up two thirds, 65.5, slightly more than two or almost two thirds of, of the whole study cohort. There was no difference in terms of age, no significant difference uh, in the age between the males and the females. Um, the women were just a little slightly younger, um, but what was significant was their marital status, right? Uh, in terms of those who were single, widowed, and divorced, we had 49.2% of the women uh, who were in this situation, right? So singlehood, whereas only just 8% of males. Now, this is important because, as you can imagine, uh, this surfaces issues uh, in terms of living arrangements, in terms of their financial situation, in terms of their socialization, uh, the risk of loneliness, and so on. In terms of schooling, again, just a slight difference between uh, females and males, uh, but it was not significant statistically. Living arrangements, again, we saw a significant difference. Here we had about 21% of women living alone. So they were managing on their own, but when we looked at the males, it was a much for a smaller figure, just 6%. So this is the profile of the women who participated in this particular study. Now, when we, when we were looking at this whole group, there were certain areas that we were particularly interested in. And one of it was in cognition or their cognitive health. And the other areas that we were interested in was their physical as well as psychological health, because these do have an impact on cognition. So I'll, I'll go through some slides to touch on our findings in these a, a different areas. So can we move on to the next slide, please? So this looks at the cognitive profile of our cohort, right? It ref, uh, we say here prevalence of MCI. I should have uh, written that out. MCI refers to mild cognitive impairment. It is a pre-dementia state. Now, this is an important stage for an individual because things can move two ways. If something is actively done, it's possible for this individual to revert to normal aging. However, if nothing much is done or subsequent risks enter into that person's life, then that individual can deteriorate into dementia. So for data for 902 of the subjects where we did extensive neuropsychological assessments, we found that the prevalence of mild cognitive impairment uh, stood at 21.5%. Now, this is high, really, in, uh, for our population. Global prevalence of MCI rates in different countries is between 16 to 21%. So we are really at the top end of uh, the prevalence rate, right? So let's move on to the next, next particular, uh, next slide, where we look looked at the MCI uh, distribution by gender. So in terms of the MCI group, there were 109, uh, 197 individuals out of the 902, right, who met the MCI criteria. So they had mild cognitive impairment. And of these, 60% were females, all right? Again, a higher group compared to the males were only at about 40%. And uh, we had 118 females. So just try to remember this because we will revisit this figure later on. Now, in terms of what sort of mild cognitive impairment these individuals had, let me just briefly explain. So we know that there are two possible types of mild cognitive impairment. 
One referred to amnestic uh, mild cognitive impairment, and as the name amnestic suggests, um, it is purely memory problems, right, that they present with. And these individuals are really at risk of going on to Alzheimer's disease. The other group is a non-amnestic MCI. And here the non-amnestic refers to they don't have memory problems, but they have problems in other areas of cognition. For example, attention, concentration, social cognition, executive functioning, and so on. Now, again, we find whether it is just one area in which they have problems or whether it is more than one area of these cognitive domains that they have problems in, females were still higher than the males. And there you see the figures are in red, right? If you looked at just one domain, so <clears throat> let's say that it was only concentration difficulties that they had. Again, females were almost um, double or three times that uh, of males. And if you looked at more than one domain, <clears throat> attention, concentration, social cognition, for example, again, it was almost, almost double the rate uh, in females, all right? So important figures again, right, to uh, reflecting the risk that females are at, the older females. Next slide. We then, <clears throat> we then also looked at uh, mood symptoms. We looked at past history of depression and we found that uh, the, and here you see the um, uh, figures which are highlighted in red, which shows that there were definitely very much more females, uh, again, uh, compared to the males with a past history of depression. And this was a significant difference. The p-value shows you that. When we actually assessed these subjects for depressive symptoms during that study, again, we found Females had very much more depressive symptoms. Now, these were subsyndromal uh, depressive symptoms, which means that symptoms of depression are there, but they did not, or they were not enough to meet the criteria for a major depressive disorder. But nonetheless, they were troubled and they were experiencing depressive symptoms. And again, females significantly more than the males. When we looked at anxiety symptoms, again, a similar pattern. The females, again, having very much more uh, subsyndromal symptoms compared to the males, and again, a significant difference. All right, so females already at risk. Next uh, slide, please. We also looked at the history of medical conditions. Now, where uh, most... Uh, Things like hypertension, diabetes, and hyperlipidemia, the rates between males and females were almost equal. But when it came to other medical conditions, we found that females uh, were very much more, they were very much more amongst the females. And these were problems like arthritis, osteoporosis, thyroid problems, and gastrointestinal problems. Okay, so higher prevalence of medical conditions found amongst these older females. Next slide. Now, this is a very busy slide, uh, but it, it is to really highlight to you the extensive investigations that we did to look at the physical status of our adults, right? Older adults in the study. And so here on your left are the various tests that we did. And we also measured their physical activity level. So two important things. And here on the right, just pay attention that the differences that we found between females and males significantly uh, was, was, was significant in all the areas. And here we have males actually performing better on all these uh, tests as compared to females. So let's look at a summary of what I've said in the next slide. So in terms of physical strength, in terms of their balance, their speed and coordination, females were poorer. The older women were performing poorer, right, compared to males. In terms of physical activity levels also, they were not as active. Again, a significant difference compared to the uh, males. Next slide. We now look at exercise uh, amongst our uh, males and females. Again, females reported spending fewer hours per week on exercise, right? 
a significant, and it was a significant difference between the uh, males and females. Next slide. Okay. So, so important things that we just before we move on to psychological variables, we we looked at exercise, we looked at the physical strength uh, through various measures. And all of these women were performing very much uh, significantly poorer than the males. Now, these are important areas because they do and can contribute to cognitive decline. So that's why it's important to uh, know about this. Now, coming to psychological variables, what we found uh, was that, again, we st studied various variables. We looked at social connectedness. We looked at satisfaction of individuals with areas of life, and we looked at quality of life uh, in, uh, for these individuals. So these were a lot of these were self-report questionnaires, and this is how they reported. Again, females reported significantly lower levels of being socially connected. Their satisfaction with life was very much lower, and their quality of life, they appraised it also as very low and all this was in comparison to the males right the next slide the next uh, slide looks at a psychological variable uh, termed as gratitude now this is an important positive uh, psychological variable because um, it is associated, right? Research has shown that it's very strongly and consistently associated with happiness. So high uh, gratitude levels um, uh, and enhances happiness in your life, right? And the other thing that has been shown from research uh, from brain scans is that um, higher gratitude levels, right? It contributes to well-being and also can contribute to lasting changes in the prefrontal cortex. So it's the frontal part of the brain, uh, an important uh, area for memory, for uh, executive functioning, that is decision-making, planning, and so on. So we did see this uh, difference in females, they having the higher levels of gratitude as compared to the males. All right, our next slide, please. So the other area in which uh, females outdid the males was in terms of exposure to psychosocial activities. Now, here we found that there was a significant difference and actually females actually uh, had greater exposure to music activities and artwork. Now, music and art uh, and, and there are various other, all of these are cognitive stimulating activities that help to improve cognition. And again, important. So we see that with females, Although uh, they, there were other areas in which they performed poorly compared to males, there were important areas in which they did better. And two of these, uh, do remember, was in the exposure to cognitive stimulating activities and the other in the area of gratitude. Okay, so now let's go on to the next part of this study where I'd like to present a follow-up that we did of all these individuals uh, who participated in the CHI study. So three years later, we went back to the group to try and see how things had evolved for these people. Uh, and the reason why we chose three years, because studies have shown that if changes are to occur, usually uh, it is a three-year period from when the first diagnosis was made that changes uh, tend to be seen and picked up. All right. So follow-up study, can we move on to the next slide? Now we looked at cognitive changes in the females. So remember I told you, remember the figure that we had, we had 118 individuals, females, who were in the earlier study who had mild cognitive impairment. Unfortunately, when we went back three years later, we had difficulty in, uh, in uh, reaching many of those individuals. We only managed to successfully get in touch with 41 of the females who had MCI. Uh, some of them, a few had passed on, uh, some of them had moved away, uh, a different part of Singapore, we could not contact them, some had moved overseas, uh, some were too ill and did not want to return to participate. So we only had 41, but what is interesting amongst this group is we, none of these individuals with uh, uh, MCI actually deteriorated or converted to dementia. 
We did see just one in the, amongst the males who did deteriorate within the three, three year period, but in females, none of them deteriorated. However, what we saw is there were uh, almost two thirds, right, of these women who actually converted or improved and returned to a normal aging uh, state in terms of their cognitive profile. And that's very interesting. So one of the things we suspect, right, has contributed to this, and of course, is going to be subject to further statistical analysis, was what we mentioned in the previous, in the last part of the psychological uh, um, slides. Uh, one of it was their involvement in cognitive stimulating activities. The other was their, their gratitude levels, which were significantly more uh, and we said we do know from studies that this positive gratitude leads to happiness as well as significant changes in the prefrontal cortex of the brain. And the other important thing, which I also highlighted uh, a few slides earlier, was that um, most of them uh, had non-amnestic MCI rather than amnestic MCI. So it is likely that these three, in a way, combine to help uh, produce this kind of good figures for the women, older women in our study. So actually, um, possibly because they continue to be involved in cognitive stimulating activities um, and they, they uh, sort of uh, provide a gratitude or experience gratitude uh, and that helped them uh, in actually uh, uh, not deteriorating further. The next slide, please. However, in terms of uh, mood symptoms, right, and we looked at depression and anxiety, what happened after uh, three years was that um, there were more females than males who had depressive symptoms, but the statistical significance that we saw previously had reduced. So they almost, it was almost like a catch up. Males too became depressed after three years, right? So no significant difference there. But in terms of anxiety, females definitely had very much higher anxiety scores, while males showed a decrease in their anxiety scores after three years. Okay, so that's what happened in terms of their mood symptoms. So in terms of cognition, women seem to have done better. Uh, many of them actually, rather than, than progressing to dementia, had somehow managed to help themselves uh, to revert to normal aging, whereas in terms of mood symptoms, more work needs to be done. So yes, women are at risk, um, at a higher risk, but the findings suggest that really particularly for older women with active interventions, with uh, appropriate measures, uh, we can mitigate some of these risks, uh, particularly with older women uh, where cognition is a concern, where physical health is a concern, we do know that interventions with cognitive stimulating activities, uh, with the use of physical exercises, we can help them, uh, especially with their longer life expectancy, to lead a much more fulfilling, healthier, and happier life. Right. So um, hopefully that answers some of our questions. And uh, I think I've come to my last slide. I will end. Yeah, thank you. So thank you very much, Professor Mahindran. Uh, this is probably the first study in Asia on um, depression and, and dementia uh, amongst the el under elderly women. And you see that uh, what she mentioned is something very interesting that uh, those who are more appreciative you know, are more positive, less likely to develop um, uh, dementia. The improvement of the the uh, memory and, and the concentration, the MCI. I think this, this is an important study. But I'm also glad to tell you, know, is, although it's a, it's a small study, Professor Mahendran has been working on it for more than six, seven years. You know, and I'm, I'm sure, it, but I'm glad to note that uh, listening to her and watching her is not taking a toll on a youth. He still remains so youthful and running a busy clinic, a mind care clinic in town. Um, one, one thing we, we forget to mention was that the community health and intergenerational study uh, is conducted at the Hanna Center, which is jointly, which is run by the Presbyterian Community Services. Right? We we'll thank them all. Many of them are watching uh, this, this video. 
The next speaker is Professor Juan Man Lop, and he's a, he's a wonderful uh, uh, researcher, the acting dean of, of dentistry. Uh, when I asked someone about uh, anyone in dentistry keen on geriatric, I was told it has to be Professor Juan Man Lop. And uh, at that time, is the, the dean was uh, Professor Patrick Finbar, who is now back in, in Ireland. Uh, but they've done a wonderful study, and, and it's amazing. I'm going to listen to uh, some of their findings. So she will welcome Professor Wong. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kwa, for the kind introduction. I'm just going to share my slides right now, so just give me a moment to do that. Okay. So once again, a very good afternoon, and uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Uh, I bring you greetings from the Faculty of Dentistry in NUS, and I also bring you greetings from uh, our formal dean, Professor Patrick Finbar Allen, who was uh, very instrumental in this particular study, which we're going to share with you in a while. So this afternoon, what I'd like to share is uh, to start off is really to maybe allow all of us to begin with an appreciation of oral health what it means to individuals, and then we will segue into a quick overview of what mental health is and to establish potential sort of relationships between oral health and mental health. Following that, what we'll then do is we will take a look at uh, the impact of oral health decline on individuals, in particular, the elderly population. That will allow us then to move quickly into some of the key findings that we found from the community health study that uh, Prof. Raki had also men mentioned earlier on, but this time with a focus on the dental or oral health findings. Last but not least, we will also share with uh, everyone some of the next steps with regard to the work that we have just begun. So when we look at oral health, uh, we sometimes ask ourselves, what does it mean? And, and really, oral health sometimes doesn't feature very high on our agenda. And we don't think very much about oral health until we are struck with a toothache. And for those of us who have experienced a toothache before, it can be very excruciating, very uncomfortable. And then it's at that moment that we realize how important it is. So really, in terms of oral health, it serves various functions, including the ability to smile, the ability to chew, taste, swallow. So these are functions which are related to eating, right, which all of us, I am sure, enjoy. And you find that oral health is also important to allow us to be able to speak, to articulate, to express ourselves through words, through verbal communication styles. It is also a, a sort of function that allows us to convey our emotions to one another, how we feel. And all these different functions need to be performed with confidence without any pain or discomfort in the facial sort of region. So in a very broad sense, this is what oral health is all about. And ultimately, oral health will also then help us to contribute to general health, the overall well-being. And there is also an element of uh, mental well-being associated with oral health as well, as we'll see in a bit. And ultimately, it will also contribute to the overall quality of life. So this is a, a kind of definition of what oral health is. Now let's take a look at what mental health is. So according to the WHO, this is one dimension or one way in which we can look at mental health. And essentially it comprises of various tenets. The first tenet is really the ability of helping individuals realize their function, their abilities. And as a result of which, helping them to work productively and also cope with the normal stresses of life and ultimately contribute to their community in which they live, work, and play in. Right? So then the question is, now that we have an understanding of what oral health and mental health are, the question then is, how are they related or is there any relationship between these two different domains of health? Well, I'm just going to share with you uh, two conditions which sometimes can manifest across the entire lifespan. And these are bruxism for a start. So what is bruxism? So bruxism essentially is a, um, is a condition where we find that individuals may clench and grind their teeth, right? And there are two sorts of um, types of bruxism, one that occurs largely while sleeping and the other while an individual is awake. Of course, the causes of bruxism can be very varied and sometimes we may not even know the cause of bruxism. 
However, the literature has shown that stress could be a possible predisposing factor or a risk factor for bruxism. So how does bruxism manifest itself in the mouth? Uh, a couple of ways. The first is really you can hear this very loud grinding of the teeth, right? And if this doesn't, uh, it goes unchecked, what will happen then is that the biting surfaces of the teeth can easily fracture. They can chip off as a result of the grinding. Or sometimes you find that the teeth become very flat, right? So with a flattened tooth structure, it then predisposes individuals to sensitive teeth, for example, and it might also compromise their ability to chew. Bruxism can also create or result in soreness in the facial region, so the around, region around the cheek, that area could also um, render some form of pain and discomfort. So that's bruxism. Another condition which sometimes we also do notice is what we call the temporomandibular joint disorders or TMJ for short. So if you were to put our fingers just in front of our ears, you'll feel a joint and that's what we call the temporomandibular joint. So in cases where there are temporomandibular joint disorders, what happens is that individuals may experience pain or discomfort in the area they might have difficulty in opening their mouths wide enough, so they have limited sort of a range of motion, and that in turn could also compromise chewing. Right? So again, stress has been kind of um, implicated, like stress is implicated for many, many conditions, and stress has also been implicated as a possible risk factor for temporomandibular joint disorders, other than other factors such as trauma or even um, her hereditary sort of factors as well. Yeah. So these two conditions uh, can affect anyone across the entire lifespan, right? But what we now want to move on into is really to take a look at the older generation. As they age through life, how does their oral health decline over time and as a result of which their oral function decline? And what is its impact on individuals? So on screen right now, you will see a, a series of pictures uh, which depict a different clinical presentations of teeth in the mouth. So at the top of the screen, you will see a full complement of natural teeth. And then in the second picture, you will see that some teeth have been lost. And in the final picture, what you see is actually a set of dentures, which replaces all the natural teeth in an individual. So what we see here is that there's an increasing loss of natural teeth. And associated with this increasing loss of natural teeth could be various risk factors, including age. Right? including multiple comorbidities such as chronic diseases like diabetes, which is very associated with uh, periodontal disease or gum disease. Reduced tongue mobility, there could also be loss of biting pairs that result in a decline in oral function. So increasingly, you find that with an increasing loss of teeth in the mouth, that could actually contribute to a decline in the oral function, and the risk factors would include age, the presence of other chronic conditions, reduced tongue mobility, or even the loss of biting pairs of natural teeth. Right? I'll talk a little bit about, more about the biting pairs in a bit. So this is research which has, which has gone to show how important our natural teeth are or how important teeth are or healthy teeth are. So this is a study which looked at nutrition, the impact of oral health in terms of the number of teeth and the nutritional intake. So if you look at this study, what happens is that across the different sort of nutritional components with reduced teeth or fewer teeth, it actually reduces the nutritional intake, right? So essentially, if you are edentulous with no teeth, then you find that your nutrient intake across all the different categories is actually compromised or reduced. And what are some of the possible mechanisms which have led or which could lead to this um, poorer nutrition? could include, for example, a functional limitation by way of a reduction in the number of teeth that are present in the mouth. So with fewer teeth in the mouth, if you can imagine, if you were to close our mouth, our teeth bite into position. So if you have fewer teeth, then fewer teeth bite into position, and that will affect the ability to chew, and as a result of which will have an impact on the kind of food choices that we make and ultimately lead to a compromise in nutrition. Right? So with a reduction in the natural teeth, number of natural teeth in the mouth, the bite force also decreases. In addition to that, sometimes within the mouth, you might be plagued by inflammation, by inflammatory diseases such as gum disease, which can result in the loss of teeth, and in that sense, result also in 
uh, a reduced number of natural teeth within the mouth. So this was a, a, a sort of a, a diagrammatic representation to kind of diagrammatically show how poor oral health could potentially be a determinant of malnutrition as well as sarcopenia. So if you take a look at the top of the, of the diagram over here, essentially with poorer oral health, what it leads to is poorer nutrient intake. And if this is confounded by other diseases in the mouth or even general diseases, chronic conditions, what it then leads to is really changes in the food choices of an individual. Right? So with a changed food choice and food selection, that can contribute or lead to malnutrition, which in turn could actually result in sarcopenia, uh, as well as physical frailty. So as individuals age, we find that the presence of a healthy set of teeth and gums and good oral health is important to avert some of these uh, complications and consequences down the road. So this was also a, a study that was done to kind of take a look and see at how oral health could potentially impact cognitive function. So the current evidence is complex and um, I don't think there is a sort of definitive conclusion to say that there's a direct relationship or a direct causal association, right, between poor oral health and cognitive malfunction. Um, but what we have found is that poor oral health by way of missing teeth or gum disease could potentially highlight possible risk factors for compromised cognitive function. So what that basically means is also if we are able to detect oral health problems by way of oral diseases early on, they could signal to us that these are potential risk factors that could lead to cognitive um, dysfunction or compromised cognitive function, as I will show you from some of the results of uh, the community health study that we did. So this was the, a subset of the study that Prof. Arati mentioned earlier on. Um, this was essentially where we examined a, a segment of the sample, and these were individuals aged between 60 and 90. The findings that I'm going to share with you are not limited to the female population. Uh, it includes the entire male and the female population. However, a larger proportion of the sample that we looked at from a dental perspective comprised uh, the female population. So what we then did was we did a clinical dental examination for these uh, participants. We looked at whether they had, how many natural teeth did they have remaining? Because this gives us an idea of how many biting pairs they have in their mouths. And earlier on, we mentioned how the biting pairs does affect their nutrition by way of their chewing, right? So that was why we were interested in looking at that. We looked also at the presence of uh, gum disease in these individuals, as well as the presence of tooth decay or dental caries in these individuals, right? Um, so what did we then find uh, from this particular study? So out of a sample of a over slightly over 700 participants, these are some of the findings that we noted. So when we looked at the participants, we kind of categorized them into three broad categories by way of what we call the Eigner Index. The Eigner Index essentially gives us the, a, a, an overview of the number of biting pairs these individuals have. So those who are categorized into Eigner Index A, these are individuals where they had the full contact of their back teeth. So if you can imagine, if you had a full a uh, complement of biting teeth at the back of the mouth that would actually aid in chewing, aid in biting, right? And, and therefore facilitate better uh, nutrition in the longer term. Those in categories B1, B2, and B3 would be those who have at least one contacting uh, pair of teeth. And those who are in B4 or C would have no contacts at all, right? So what we then did was we then applied uh, the mini mental state examination, which gives an indication of uh, cognitive impairment. So if you have a higher score from the mini mental state examination, that signals a better state of cognitive function. A lower score would be um, more compromised cognitive function. So as you can see from the graph, what it shows is that generally, if individuals with Eigner Index A, they scored better in terms of the mini mental state examination, thereby indicating that uh, in terms of their cognitive function, they're less compromised, right? As opposed to those with fewer uh, sort of biting contacts, 
for example, if you look at the graph in, in the categories B4 and BC of the INA index, their sort of uh, mini mental state examination scores were lower than those who were in the INA index A group, right? So essentially what we found from this study, uh, this particular study was, if you were to look at mild cognitive impairment, which Prabhupati also mentioned earlier on, it is actually one of the pre potential predictors or possible predictors is actually the quality and the quantity of the biting contacts, right? So the fewer the biting contacts, uh, it could be uh, a risk factor for cognitive impairment. So along the lines of uh, biting contacts, naturally, if you have more natural teeth remaining in the mouth, that would also potentially be beneficial because if you have fewer natural teeth present in the mouth, then it could be, again, it could predispose an individual to mild cognitive impairment. The third area that we looked at was whether or not some inflammatory condition in the mouth, for example, the condition of their gums, the gum health, would have an impact on cognitive impairment. So what the study showed there was that um, there were more cases of mild cognitive impairment uh, noted among individuals with poorer gum health. And so poor gum health would mean uh, a manifestation of bleeding gums, uh, even on gentle brushing or swollen gums. So because these are clinical indications of gum disease. So in summary, what we then did was uh, from the study, what we found was that mild cognitive impairment could be, right, uh, signaled by the presence of poorer occlusal biting contacts, poorer gum health, as well as fewer natural teeth. So what are some of our next steps with regard to what we have found from this particular study? Well, clearly, the evidence that links oral health and mental wellness and cognitive decline is an area which is emerging and evolving. right? And we do see some possible predisposing or risk factors which may impact cognitive decline or wellness, mental wellness. However, the relationship is very, very complex and the current evidence may not be sufficient to fully explain the complexity of this relationship. What we would then need to do is to engage and embark in more work to facilitate a clearer understanding and appreciation of the potential associations between oral health and mental health as well as cognitive decline. But what this particular study has done for us, I think it has paved the way for us to continue to navigate this interesting area of work to better understand how one's oral health can actually have a significant bearing on their overall health and well-being, in particular in terms of their mental wellness. Yeah. So one of the one of the things that uh, as a follow-up is really to look at potential longitudinal uh, follow-up studies where we follow individuals through, similar to what Prof. Rati had mentioned earlier on with the three-year follow-up. So that's another phase that we're going to uh, proceed into as we continue the work in this area. So on that note, I would like to wrap up the presentation just with a word of thanks, um, in particular to Prof. Kwa as well as the team from the CHI study uh, for allowing us to be part of that study to look at the oral health component. And also my other colleagues, uh, Prof. Finba, Dr. Tan Mena, Dr. Gabriel Lee, as well as Dr. Rakim Mittal, uh, as well as our dental surgery assistant, who assisted us in, in the conduct of this study. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wong. Uh, excellent lecture. Um, as Professor Wong mentioned, um, we only want to talk to the dentists when we have a dental problem. Uh, um, I always tell my friends, make sure your dentist is a good friend of yours because you never know when. Uh, all right, um, let me press on with the, the last uh, talk and it's on something of relevance to all of us in, in, this, uh, in this webinar, whether you're in, in Singapore, or Malaysia, Australia, North America, it's a question of living in place. You know? uh, when we grow older, do we want to stay in our own house or does it mean that we must all move on to the old people's home? You know? And a lot of people who want to stay in their own house, you know, uh, what happened in the group, oh, are they caring, issues raised by uh, Professor Mahindran also about caring. Um, so this is a study, uh, part of the community health and intergenerational study. In fact, the acronym CHI or CHI or energy in Chinese was coined by our, our first patron of the Mind Science Center, the late Mrs. Tio Po Yim. Now, um, when we talk about 
aging in place, I, I think we must thank the government for doing something. You know, Singapore is a city for all ages, building senior friendly communities, um, also multi-generation housing, living near to your family members, sub subsidies for uh, retrofitting the, the flats, silver zone to help us to walk, and also for the lifts. But these are only the hardware. The most important is the software. Who's going to take care of you? There are three important areas we'll think about. And firstly, there must be strong family bonding, right, in terms of parenting. And also, um, uh, this is a study been conducted by Professor Wilson Tam on intergenerational study. And that will be uh, discussed at a different time. Um, the second is make sure that beside your family, there's also community support. The, fam the, the community helps you out. Yeah. So there are two studies, one done by Professor Shifali, a nurse, um, about uh, some people with mild depression or mild anxiety, how can we, um, how can we uh, help them out? And so an appointment to see Professor um, Mahindran, uh, it will be about three months. You know? So if it's very mild, can, can, um, can, can we train some retired seniors to, be, uh, to provide psychological support for them? So the study we've done is called a brief integrative personal therapy. And I'll talk to you later on on the uh, study we've done on HL every day. And the final part of is most important community services, providing uh, family home care, domiciliary care, and day care. Now, if anyone has any access to the Ministry of Health, and maybe you could tell them that one of the reasons why the hospitals are all now chock a block, you know, it's all full because we don't have enough of domiciliary care. You know, I worked for many years in England. If some an elderly person has a problem, you know, sending to the emergency department and admitted to the ward, we often send the doctors to the home, and the, and the family would be delighted they visit the home and they manage at home, and then there'll be a, a nurse that comes on a different day to make sure the person is well. They will often recover in a couple of days. But if not, they send everybody to the emergency department in all the hospitals, you'll be admitted to the ward, and you now the ward's almost 95% full, impossible. So we'll think of a different paradigm in terms of, of care. Now, um, most people who want to live in their own home, we did a study almost 30 years ago. And this was done together with the Singapore Action Group of Elders. Um, the group present at the time was a GP called um, Dr. Lim Chan Yong. And this study was called the uh, Center, the Sensor, or the, or the Center for the Study of Aging over at Topayo did a study of 245 elderly people, 60 years above. They were like 82%, 80% of them prefer to stay at home, you know, in the, in the final days of their life or even in, in, when you retire. And only 18% or less than 20% think that they prefer to stay in, in a community home. You know, sometimes they're living alone. They think that maybe to, going to a, a good home is a wonderful place for them. But 80% of Singaporeans would want prefer to stay at home. But in reality, what happened now? now in reality, uh, in, in the data show that less than 25% stay at home uh, or die at home, uh, but almost 70% uh, in the hospital. So what actually happened along the way? You know? So if we want to make sure that we want to live in the, our favorite uh, uh, home or our condominium, and how can we provide kind of support? Now, having said that, I must also say that not all homes are bad. There are also good homes. Uh, every time I go back to the UK, I'll visit my old professor and he used to stay in a wonderful home, a studio flat, and there are a lot of, about 200 seniors down there. They even have their own restaurant, their own theatres, hairdressers. On the weekend, a bus will bring them down to London, the West End, to see the, the, uh, the, the shows. You know. It's a wonderful place. There is a home that, is a, that I was asked to be a volunteer some uh, 35 years ago. And this is home called the Woodlands Home for the Elderly. And you see a picture of uh, Professor Yo Ken Hing, who was then the uh, chairman of the home. He invited uh, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew to the home uh, because the home at Kranji was to be demolished because they wanted to make way for the, 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 the turf club or the race course. And now we the papers the last few days the risk cost is going to be demolished to build HDB flats, you know. So at that time, 
the, the home at Woodland was wonderful because you see it's this very rustic setting. It was at a forested area. It was the barracks of the British soldiers before the Second World War. And they were well, very well camouflaged by a forest. And I love to go down there to the, to the Woodland's home and uh, lots of LDP people down there. Uh, um, but it's a bit overcrowded, you know. And so one of the reasons we asked Mr. Lee to, to visit the place was because uh, to, to tell him that it's a good place for people to retire you know, uh, uh, if they want to. It's so much ground. It was, uh, the environment was, was, was wonderful for them to play games or, to, or activities. This is my picture of myself. Uh, I was then uh, very young and uh, the research on dementia I took the last vestige of my youth and aged so, so much after that, you know. Um, but I wrote something about the home and it's now in a, it's, it's now in a, a, a novel called Listening to Letter from America. I'm making a, a little pitch because this book has now been used in Harvard in, in, a, in a course on anthropology. And the base of the, the setting of, the, of, the, of this story is at the Woodlands home. And, uh, and next month in late July, there's going to be a musical based on this, on this novel. And it's the setting at the home of the old people down there. And it's something about ageism. I, I met an elderly person in the home, a, a, a veteran of the Second World War, an Indian man. And they told me that doctor, they value you because you're young. Look at me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a broken man. I don't have a leg left, but in my youth, I defended Singapore against the invading Japanese army at a causeway. And along the way, he, he, he lost his leg also. So it's something about how we value seniors along the way, right? Also something about, about uh, mental health that they can recover uh, from their post-traumatic stress disorder. I want to move on to um, something on the study that we did, and the study is on parenting. You know? How do we be a good parent? You know? So we, we borrowed a, a rating scale from, from I think, the UK, uh, and it, it is something on if you, positive aging, uh, but parenting means that you, you, take, you have a lot of uh, care for your, for your children, and uh, you help them out in your life, you're, you're more, more proactive. Authoritative means you're much more uh, stern, serious, Authoritarian means a lot of punishment. Permissive means you can do what, let them do whatever they want to do. Now we realize that this is a very uh, um, artificial kind of assessment or questionnaire, you know, because uh, about 20 years ago, when we were conducting a course on psychotherapy, um, a friend of mine came from uh, England, from, from King's College, to do the course, and he told me that he read in a newspaper, the Straits Times, that there was a course coming up on parenting to be run by a, a British uh, family family therapist. And they told me that is ridiculous. That family in Asia are stronger than in, in America or the UK. Two people should be doing some study and going to America and UK to tell, to tell us about parenting. So a lot of things that we have to do, the, the chief study is to see how we can improve on what we are doing. So it's not just borrowing a scale and then we use it. You know. So we're going to modify it and see what else we can do you know, to improve on it. And a couple of papers been published now on parenting. Um, but as all of you listen to me and you can reflect on your own lives and your, your parents and all your grandparents have never been to, to a, a, a course on parenting, but they've done pretty well, isn't it? The way they've looked after, you see Professor Mahindran, you see uh, Professor Wong. I'm sure they'd be able to give them credit to their, to their parents or their grandparents. This is a picture of my, my grandmother. My grandmother, uh, 70 years ago, uh, this, this week, uh, was a month before that, 70 years ago was the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II. And 70 years ago, Malaya and Singapore were under the British. And so my grandmothers felt that because the, the Queen is going to coronate the coronation of the Queen in our family, she is the most powerful woman, the, the matriarch of the family. And she assembled all her grandchildren you know, and told them, okay, we'll take a picture. And those of the men, the boys will go to the right side, the left, the girls go to the, the left side. And so we all stood together. You see on the, the among the, 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 the boys, I'm the third person on your right. All right, that's how I look like 70 years ago. Uh, I can see uh, um, Maureen uh, laughing away at the background there. Uh, um, but um, this is, so my grandmother said, uh, uh, arrange yourself, assemble yourself, that's what we did. I met, my grandmother had never been to school. She never read any book on parenting. And uh, the grandchildren, by, by the time she passed on, there were 70 grandchildren. And we all done, fairly well in a small town in Batu Pahat in Malaya. You know. 
couple of people became doctors, other engineers, teachers, nurses. Well, we, we did fairly well. My, my grandmother did, didn't go to any school to, to learn about parenting. I want to see what happened to the people uh, in this study, in the cheese study. How did how do they parent their own children here? So person, personal parenting style. Uh, the women in the study, in the cheese study, scored higher in being positive, authoritative, and authoritarian. The men scored higher in positive, authoritative, and permissive. And those people who have who score higher, who have a more positive and permissive style, seem to better satisfaction. Well, but I've discussed this with some of my colleagues in, on family therapists. This is very artificial because you ask them at this point in time. Of course, it varies. When the kids are younger, you tend to be more authoritative. And when you go older, you cannot be authoritative. You've got to vary it along. So this particular frame in time, so there's errors in this kind of study. You know? So we try to make sure they have, in terms of uh, uh, 30 years or 40 years, tell us the style of your, your parents. But what about our, grand, our own parents then? When these people talk to their parents, their parents, uh, like our grand, our, our uh, grandparents, they're high in positive and authoritative, low in permissive, but women are more authoritarian, right? Uh, so you ask yourself, is it true? For all of you listening in, are your parents more authoritarian? But we did a study amongst the, the baby boomers, those born between 1946 to 1964, the, the person who's most important in the family, who, who, is, who is the homemaker, who plays a crucial role, is the mother who talks to them about values, about career. That means the mother, the one who determines the moral compass in your mind. So, so sometimes you see people, they'll say, well, my mother, my mother is just a homemaker, but that's a very important role you know, to guide you in your life. And now we have in terms of family care, uh, we find that the, the, we asked them, the, the, in a cheese study about the elderly women and the men, uh, many of them will say that uh, they're given care but the children seem to provide more care to the, to the mothers uh, and also provide financial support rather than the men. But in terms of providing support, caring for the grandchildren, once again, the women have a role. So often the question asked about, about uh, uh, depression in, in seniors. The women seem to have less depression because the women often have a role and, and men don't even have that kind of role. But in my family, you see that it's 50-50. My wife and I, we have split down the middle in terms of caring the grandchildren. Well, remember the, grand, the, the, the picture I showed to you, my grandmother? She was able to assemble the, 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 the grandkids together, you know. But for me, it's almost impossible. Three of them were all trying to run away, you know. Uh, um, so you ask yourself, hey, what happened? And I, when I was studying as a, as a postgraduate student in England, uh, we had to study books about parenting. Not because I believe in it, but because I know they're going to come out in MCQ questions for the exams. So after studying the books from, in, from America by Minuchin, after that, forget about it. England by uh, ben, by Bentovim is all a theoretical framework way to pass the exam. But after the exam is over, uh, uh, I forgot about what they tell me then. But once again, I think we do what, what we think about what we are doing. But the most the most uh, uh, sad thing about the study was we found that there's no correlation between parenting styles and living with the family. It doesn't mean that we are more uh, uh, positive or more authoritative. The families, uh, the children will want to stay with you. you know. So the, more, the sample size being small, we hope to repeat this in, uh, um, in future studies. Now, I want to move on now to a study about how the, family, the society or the community can support you. And this is based on earlier study called the Jurong, Jurong Aging Study on Dementia Prevention. And this is what we did. We, we, we got the people living in Jurong West around the, the Jurong Point shopping mall. And we heard about almost a thousand pe people. You know. And the first thing we did was to teach them something about health education, dementia, di uh, diabetes, and then divide them into four groups, Tai Chi, mindfulness, music, and art, and find out what happened to them. So the first study in Asia on dementia prevention. And then it was something also on choir singing. We found that although we did a lot of wonderful study doing brain scan, the most important thing is about, is about the social connectedness. They begin to care for one another, right? So these are incidental findings, but most important. Similarly, for study also on, on, on uh, the rainforest, and although they've done a lot, they know each other better, the most important study is to begin to care for one another. So now we have got we have the H12 everyday program. Uh, um, and as you see, the, all of them are together and 
during the time of the, uh, the, the pandemic lockdown, they began to care for one another because they ring each other out and say, can I help you out? I'm going to the shopping mall, can I buy something for you? So this social, this community support is very important. Uh, and then for some of you who are keen to know, this is the first time we're releasing the data to the public uh, on the deep out five, five years outcome. You see the dementia prevalence is only 3%, whereas the Ministry of Health uh, report uh, tells us that it's 10%. But this group in, in the Jurong area with intervention is just 3%. And um, I'll maybe skip this, but let me know that a lot of people who are old, but they are still very active. You know, uh, um, and they, are, they can pr provide a big role in the community in terms of, uh, of care and support. And uh, once again, to, to uh, give a summary for aging in place, important for family care, parenting, very important. Uh, uh, community support and also community services. I want to thank all those people involved in this study, all our donors, uh, and to thank um, uh, all of you for listening in. It's time for some question. I've already got some question for Professor Mahindran. Um, the first question is about um, the uh, follow-up study uh, on, on uh, MCI. And um, Professor Mahindran, what are the risk factors for MCI? And you, okay, sorry. Sorry, uh, what are the risk factors for MCI? Yes. Is that, yeah, okay. So in general, I think there are several risk factors which have been identified. Um, definitely, um, uh, medical conditions are risk factors, and particularly things like hypertension, diabetes, which directly can affect the vessels in the brain, of course, so they are definite clear risk factors, and that includes uh, hyperlipidemia, ischemic heart disease, right? So medical conditions can. Um, and then the other areas could be things like uh, lack of activity, physical exercise. Um, I think someone asked a question about sarcopenia in the Q&A. Yeah, all those are also risk factors uh, for dementia, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then the other big area is the mood states, right? We do know that depression, anxiety, depression more than anxiety are associated with the risk of uh, cognitive uh, decline. Um, and the other area, of course, is social activities as well. Uh, a person who is alone, right, does not uh, interact with people, uh, leads a very secluded life, also at risk. People who don't engage in activities that can help stimulate the brain. Yeah, things like that are all risk factors for MCI to proceed on to dementia. Yeah. I think the most important finding in, in, in your study, Professor Mahindran, is that uh, on the three year follow up study, 60% uh, of them improve. This is marvelous, you know. Yeah. Uh, I think partly because in the Hanna Center, they do have activities uh, uh, down there. And I know the Hannah Center, um, Mr. David uh, uh, is down there, David Lim. They, they also te teach them to be appreciative. So you have, mm -hmm. the people there are very kind, uh, the sign of kindness, appreciative. Um, but I, I wonder whether uh, um, when, we intervene, when we intervene using the uh, H12 Everyday Program, uh, uh, would that also reduce the MCI level within the community? Yes, definitely. I think because the Age Well uh, Everyday Program is really a combination of cognitive stimulating activities that we have extensively investigated and shown that they do benefit individuals and they benefit at various levels uh, in terms of their mood, in terms of even cognitive changes, right? We have done MRIs to show that people who have in, been involved in these, for example, mindfulness practice, we have actually shown that there were cognitive changes over a period of time. Uh, we have shown changes in gut bacteria of people who have been involved. So it's really a, a, a sort of uh, uh, extensive changes that can an uh, individual can bring about to help themselves by participating in these kind of activities. And definitely the age well, uh, program, which is very nicely packaged for individuals, I think would definitely be beneficial. Right. So we hope more people will sign up for the uh, H12 Everyday Program around the island. Um, now also, um, we know that um, prevention is so important. And I want to ask Professor uh, Wong, um, I know you're in preventive dentistry. Tell, tell people what, what can be done you know, for 
is something we have, we have missed out in some of our programs. What do you think the besides the university people, the community, what can they do, do in terms of preventive dentistry? Hmm. Right. Thanks, uh, thanks Rafa, for that. And I think one of the one of the things with regards to preventive dentistry, a first step really is to dispel, right, the, that sort of perception that oral health uh, will definitely and automatically decline with age. I think sometimes people think that with increasing age, it is natural to lose their natural teeth. Uh, mm -hmm. However, I think increasingly that paradigm is shifting, uh, largely because people are getting more aware about how we can prevent the onset of the two most common dental conditions, which are tooth decay, as well as periodontal disease or gum disease, which can result in tooth loss. And so essentially, when you want to prevent these two very common conditions, um, there are a couple of things that we can take, take note of. So in terms of tooth decay, really, it's in relation to the diet. And so with regard to the diet, one should avoid um, excessive consumption of karyogenic diets, which are largely diets with have, uh, which very high sort of sugar content. Um, I think it's not only the quantity, but it's also the frequency in which we consume um, these uh, sugared beverages or food items. Um, so what we generally advocate with regard to the prevention of tooth decay is that try and spread out your consumption of these sugared beverages so that your teeth are not uh, in constant sort of contact with the acid that's generated when the bacteria feeds on the food, right? So that's, that's for tooth decay. In terms of gum disease, I think that is a condition which sometimes we don't realize we have it, uh, largely because in its very early stages, it is actually painless. And one of the classical signs of um, early gum disease is bleeding or even on gentle brushing. Uh, and that in itself causes a little bit of issues because when individuals see that their gums bleed as they brush, they then stop the brushing. Uh, but if you stop the brushing, then you don't eliminate uh, the, the etiological sort of factor, right, which is largely bacteria. So if you don't remove the bacteria, then the, the, the gums will continue to be inflamed. Um, and as a result of which, you will not then be able to address the gum problem. Um, so what we then need to do is to make sure that um, even if there's gentle, on gentle brushing, there's bleeding, what we need to do is to make sure that we continue to position the toothbrush at the right location in the mouth. And that is really between the junction of the gums and the teeth. Um, and this, is, this will allow, then, allow you to then be able to clean the gums at the same time. Right? Um, and so one of the easiest ways to prevent gum disease is to make sure that when we clean our teeth, that we position the bristles of the toothbrush at the junction between the teeth and the gums. Um, and in so doing, clean the gums as well. Uh, apart from brushing, then obviously, Flossing is also useful because flossing will allow you to reach areas which the toothbrush, tooth, toothbrush bristles may not be able to reach. Yeah, so broadly, these are some of the some of the ways in which we can prevent right, right, right. Uh, And of course, the last one is really to make sure that you have your regular checks. Uh, just one more point, uh, which just came to mind, is even for denture wearers, I think that's an important area that we need to look at as well. Because sometimes when we wear dentures, uh, because the teeth are artificial, they're plastic, and people think, well, we don't need to take care of them so much, right? Uh, but the reality is that sometimes if we don't take care of denture hygiene, it can actually lead to uh, sort of fungal infections uh, in the mouth, especially on the upper jaw, the palate, uh, which can then cause uh, discomfort for the patients. And the other thing is really not to wear the dentures throughout the day. Uh, for example, when sleeping at night, to remove the dentures so that uh, they can be clean. Yeah. Right. Thank you. I think it, it, it reminds me that we, we often try to improve on our HUL everyday program or the all program. So in, in future, we may want to include uh, dental health. Uh, uh, better remind Cindy, who is in charge of our HUL program, that there be something on dental health. And we'll call upon you, uh, Rob Wong, for that. Yeah. Thank you. So let's run through some of the questions we asked. They say, um, uh, I think I can answer on behalf of Professor Mahindran. Are all the participants, are all Singaporeans, they are either Singaporeans or, or PR. Um, yeah. And is yeah, uh, risperidone uh, helpful for depression and anxiety? What do you think, Prati? No, no I, I think there is a risk uh, this, uh, for risperidone. There's actually a black label warning about using it in older people because of the risk of uh, strokes, for example, and cardiovascular accidents. So if at all it has to be considered, then it's only for people who have what we refer to as behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia. So they have really 
very severe psychotic symptoms or agitation. And even then, we would use it for very short periods, maybe at the most three months. Uh, it is not the first line of treatment for dementia. We have anti-dementia medications for that. Things like donifazil and imantin and rivastipine. So that's yep. important. Yeah. That's right. There's a the, the couple of interesting questions. There's somebody who asked whether would it be better in terms of a longitudinal study, even for uh, Professor Wong and, and Professor Mahindran, to start much earlier. I, and I agree with this person, and because uh, when we send it for publication, the reviewers said trying to do uh, um, he healthy lifestyle when you are 60 is a bit too late. And, and I agree, you start at 30 and 40. And someone asked a, a, a more pertinent question. We talk about those with uh, physical or mental health problem. What about those who are very resilient? And then the studies in, in, in the data analyze it, Rati, who are the very resilient women you know, who, okay. uh, who have done so, so well? Yeah, so I think there were interesting questions about diet. Did we specifically look at the women in terms of those who, who actually didn't, uh, um, who remained MCI and didn't, uh, you know, who didn't revert to normal aging. So what I have to say is, yes, the data is there, but we are still in the process of um, analyzing it. Um, we did we did 10 hours of uh, data collection. So you can imagine it was spread over five visits. So there's extensive data, but um, as I say, we are slowly analyzing it and hopefully we will be able to share much of those. And for some of those things that we didn't do in the first phase, we did it in phase two studies. So there was a question of, did you look at the diet? Uh, did you intervene and provide something and see whether there were any changes? These have been done in the phase two studies. So again, it is a matter of maybe Mind Science Center arranging for talks subsequently to follow up on those findings. Yeah, and we could invite speakers, for example, the diet part was done by Prof Kim from the NUS Department of Food Science and Technology. So the research has been done, but it's a matter of, you know, uh, getting it and presenting it mm -hmm. to everyone, yeah, sharing it with everyone. Right, and, and someone asked also, um... Is it because the, the, the more men have shown signs of depression, but they don't they don't uh, uh, complain about it? They take their own lives. Suicide rate obviously higher in, in men than in women. You know, I always tell say the men are the endangered species. You know, the, you know and and uh, but then they, they, they have said as this, anything can be done uh, uh, for the women. Uh, uh, they able to maybe they go to see the doctors and they will complain to the doctors. So it's better to be a complainer or just skip yourself and and and. Uh, and a, a struggle within your depression, Rati? No, I think uh, that it, it's really everyone should seek help as early as possible, uh, rather than to leave it till it becomes really severe and then it becomes a problem. Uh, and the other thing, particularly for anxiety and depression in the elderly people, as I say, it may be uh, early signs that uh, dementing or cognitive decline is already setting in. So I really would recommend that, you know, if older people are, are exhibiting some of these sign, signs, better to get an evaluation to be sure, right? Mm. Rather than leaving them alone. And I think it's Genevieve from RSVP, she asked a, a very pertinent question, you know, um, and how many of the old people in this study are, are doing uh, volunteerism or doing volunteer work? So, yeah, so I, I did see that. Um, that was not studied in the first phase of the CHI study, but it was done in phase two where uh, Professor Johnson Pham did look at volunteerism. Uh, again, I don't have the results with me, but yes, it has been looked into. Yeah. Yes, there's also a, a, a question by Sharifa that, um, about um, how did transfer all their policy, both for Rati and also for Professor Wong. We've done all these studies and are of great relevance to all the Singapore of the world. Is as Sharifa asked how to transfer the policy. Anything? What do you all think? Have a have a, a, a chat with Minister um, Ong again. Rati and, and <laughs> Wong. No, I was going to say I think we need to, especially for older adults. Okay, I, I mean I know we are going to start a study soon on the younger young younger adults, right? If I'm not mistaken, it's uh, MSC is planning on that already. But in terms of the older adults, I think we we really need to um, focus on their health, right? And so uh, and also on their 
uh, and cognitive status and evaluation, your functional status. I think these are very important. So I do know that in the new programs that are being rolled out, uh, there is a lot of focus on the physical health, medical conditions and so on. But I think um, I, I would like to see maybe uh, some effort to include cognitive assessments, at least brief assessments using the modified mini mental state examination when they come yearly for their checkups and so on. I think that would be very important yeah, to pick okay. up things early. Also assessment of their mood states when they come yearly for follow-up. Things like that I think would, would, would help. Prof Wong, I, I, I hope they've not left out dental health in the SG health. Um, no, not really. So I think the first thing really is to create awareness. And I think this is one of the things which I, I suppose platforms like these uh, seek to do. Uh, because with I think with heightened awareness at the community level, that also uh, can facilitate early detection and interventions, right? So as individuals, they become more aware of some of these um, early signs, and then they can then also proactively play a role in finding out a little bit more. Uh, then I, I suppose <clears throat> from from the provider's point of view, if we could incorporate, like what Rolf Rati says, uh, these elements of early screening, I think then that will facilitate earlier interventions as well. Yeah. Yes. There's a Dr. Stephen Poa. I know he's, a, he's a old, also sometime re, uh, re, researched before. And he, he seems to be happy with your finding. He said the, uh, the sample is so small uh, for MSC and Eichner Index. Uh, Professor Wong, you want you to respond to Stephen? Um, yeah. So, 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 I think the current study really is to provide us with some preliminary insights. Um, and, and certainly this particular sample also, what we found was um, in terms of the oral health, they were actually quite good. Um, so I think we need to further the work in this area. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier on, really this whole issue about oral health and its uh, sort of relationships with mental health as well as cognitive decline is, a, is an emerging area. And I think many, many countries are also increasing their uh, sort of work in this uh, sort of um, focus, with this focus. And so I think what we, this particular initial study provides us with useful uh, sort of insights for us to direct us in the way forward. Um, and we also exploring uh, possible further collaborations to deepen and to have a deeper dive into to, to this, um, this oral health, general health uh, sort of relationship, especially for the oldest timers of the population. Yeah, certainly we will be doing that. Rathi, uh, this uh, somebody who asked uh, whether you can conclude that being grateful and cheerful will reduce the risk of cognitive impairment. And that would be a wonderful message for yeah. our kindness movement. Yeah. Dr. William Wan, I heard he's, he's coming in to listen. Be very glad that instead of all the things he's done, uh, he's told me sometimes he failed, that maybe this study shows conclusively, uh, beyond a shadow of doubt, that being appreciative. You know, Thanking your mother for the food you put on your table can prevent you from having impairment. Rati, what do you think? I, I wish I, I could stick my head out and say definitely, but I think there has been research done uh, looking at happiness index uh, in the local population, right? Uh, but I don't think they linked it with cognition. And I think I would like to do further <laughs> work on this further in terms of stats before I commit myself to it. But definitely, I think... Uh, being uh, grateful for things, I think it does make a, a difference. And as I mentioned earlier, there is research that has been done to show that people with higher levels of gratefulness uh, do exhibit uh, changes in their prefrontal cortex uh, when uh, neuroimaging is done. So yeah, I, I'm sure that will impact cognition, yeah. All right, all right. Um, there are many more questions, uh, in fact, for Prof Wong about uh, dangers and, and uh, replacing uh, with, uh, implants and many more questions. But I, unfortunately, time is not on our side and, and, and we have to conclude. But I, we'll run to the questions and maybe if you come out to leave it, everyone is anonymous, uh, except for Stephen Poa, who is brave enough to stick out his head and say, all right, I'm going to challenge the New Zealand people. You know? Very good, uh, Stephen. But if you could leave us a, a note so that we can respond to you, uh, some of the questions. Uh, uh, is, is aspirin able to stop uh, dementia? And these are very interesting questions because people ask these questions even in the internet, you know. And someone asks, is watching video uh, helpful to prevent dementia? I'm not too sure about that. Uh, watching this webinar might prevent, even because you learn something, all right? Um, so I want to, before uh, hand it on to Catherine, into 
who is uh, helping to organize this webinar. I want to thank the speakers. I want to thank Mr. Tao Heng Tan, who is watching with his whole team at Pavilion Capital, far, far away in town. And also to thank the, um, the team in the uh, uh, community health and interventional uh, study team, uh, also at the HANA Center. And of course, although this is only a one and a half hours uh, webinar, it's taken um, Catherine and Maureen and Cindy almost three months of preparation. So we must be thankful to them so as to prevent us all from having impairment, you know, from the impairment. So now I pass it on to uh, Catherine again. Thank you, Prof. Kaur. So due to the time constraints, we are unable to answer some of the questions, uh, but don't worry, we, will, we should be collating all of this and then bring them back to the speakers and possibly release a article feature for the questions that were not answered. So do follow us on Facebook and also sign up for our mailing list to be in the loop when the article is issued ready. So before we close, uh, please help us fill up uh, this post-event survey by scanning a QR code or clicking the link uh, sent by the colleague in the chat right now. Okay. So, so uh, thank you for all the speakers today as well. And then uh, on a side note, we have a uh, upcoming, actually on right now, it's an ongoing right now. June will be a celebration month for all of uh, your broken Meister Center. So we are actually celebrating the milestones and the achievements via a series of giveaways coming up on our Facebook. So uh, starting with the free limited edition tote bag, uh, we actually be giving it out to uh, visitors who come to our Mang Art Ex Experiential Lab in the month of June. So the ongoing Teens and Kids Curation places the spotlight on youth and men uh, youth mental health issues, and it also highlights the importance of intergenerational bonding in forging a resilient mind from young. So Mang Lab will actually be open for walk-in visits every Wednesday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. So feel free to come by. Yep. So. Uh, Beyond that, so we actually have uh, recently passed the milestone of a thousand Facebook followers. So we actually be running a um, book giveaway on Facebook as well, coming up very soon. Uh, so more details will actually be released in the coming days. And uh, for the HYRA program, definitely, we actually be giving out uh, the e-learning modules for free, but it's uh, subjected to some of the criteria that we will be launching on Facebook as well. So um, uh, another more interactive component that we have is actually the Dementia Asia Quiz Weeks that will be coming up uh, in the next two weeks. So it will be a four weeks worth of quiz that you actually can find out more details about how dementia uh, can be more better um, managed and mitigated. So do, look, do follow us on Facebook at My Science Center and get ready to participate in all our celebration parties. So uh, last but not least, we actually have an ongoing study on how regular probiotics will change gut microbiota levels. So and also it, may can, it can possibly improve brain performance. So if you're actually interested to be part of the study, um, please feel free to contact the research team for more information. The contact details are actually on the screen right now. So with that, we have come to the end of the 7th Bao Tiang Singh Distinguished Lecture Series. Once again, I would like to express our greatest uh, gratitude to everyone who is joining us today. And we certainly, certainly hope that this session has renewed a passion in our hearts to prioritize our well mental well-being. So thank you everyone and have a nice day. <laughs>